you want a different outcome, you have to do something different. The thing that just always stuck out was, well, I have to quit drinking. I think I'd known for a long time. (laughs) You probably know and understand this. You get to the point where you're just like, I can't do this anymore. I'm ruining my life, my relationships. I'm tired. I feel awful. I don't want to be hungover anymore. So... Helen, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. You make me and my life sound so much more exciting than it is. To set the stage for today and for being the first British guest. Yes, I'm so excited. First Brit. Woo! (laughs) So what city has your heart since London and Los Angeles are generally considered as the mecca of entertainment and pop culture worldwide? You know what? That's such a difficult question for me because obviously I grew up just outside of London and lived in London for over 10 years. My best friends, my family are there. But I have to say LA has my heart. I feel like this is my home. This is going to be my forever home. I love it here. I love the people, the weather. I love the industry here and my healthy lifestyle here. It's interesting you brought up healthy lifestyle (laughs) because I do want to say that Los Angeles is a fairly lonely city and I've had many creatives and even film director on Hollywood on the show and they talk about LA is a city that crushes many dreams. But for those who can survive, that's what makes the art form great. Mm -hmm. Uh, Any thoughts there in terms of the loneliness and just the lifestyle? Yeah, I think I was incredibly fortunate that I met an incredible group of people at Burning Man who all lived in LA. And so Burning Man is very much about community. So I kind of landed here with an amazing group. And pretty soon I started doing comedy and I joined Pretty Funny Women, which is a female comedy class and um I guess, performance group. And so I met a lot of good friends through that. And so I kind of instantly had this like comedy community and this kind of Burning Man community. And I think the most important thing to do when you come to LA is to find some kind of community to become a part of. And now as I've been here and grown and done different things, I have friends from my acting classes and people that I've met on jobs that I stay in touch with. And now, obviously, through being a podcaster, I have a podcasting community. So yeah, I do think it is very important here to build those communities and to have people around you supporting you. But in the same way, London could be just as lonely. In fact, I think I actually felt lonelier in London in some ways than I do now in LA. So according to research, since I love talking about academic research, is community and sense of belonging stays timelessly as the most important contributing factor to well-being and mental health. And if you look at level of loneliness, it's highly correlated with increased future health index outcomes. You have increased mental health and physical health challenges, increased rate for heart disease, cancer. And I really feel like with this, like a lot of mediated experience Mm -hmm. on the TV. You just had a hosting job this morning, right? Mm -hmm. So much of our existence is virtual now that I think sometimes we forget that there is a whole new natural world out there that I think is shrinking. Yeah, I agree. I actually was hosting a live stream this morning and I did it from <laughs> from my green screen studio that I have at my apartment. So yeah, a lot of what I do can be done remotely now. I like you like to record my podcasts in person because I think it's so important connection with other humans. And yeah, I'm not surprised at those statistics because I really do think that community and having good friends around you is so key to having a happy life. So you you brought this up that you actually felt lonely in London, but to my understanding, you used to go out and drink almost daily and party daily in London, yet ironically, you felt the loneliest. Yeah. Can you unpack that? Well, I think I wasn't fulfilled in my life when I was in London, and I was trying to fill that void with partying, drinking, like I was the ultimate party girl. I'd go to every party. I'd go out on a Friday night and come home on Monday morning kind of vibes. Yeah. (laughs) We go hard in London. (laughs) Yeah. I think just being unfulfilled in my career, I I was kind of directionless. And I think that's why I was just like, well, partying fills that void. But then the, you know, because you stop drinking, when you stop drinking, you're like, oh, I don't feel depressed on a Monday anymore. You know, it really changes the way that you feel about your life. For me, I thought that I had 
depression. I honestly think I was just really hungover and having a come down <laughs> for like most of the time. I was either drunk or hungover. And I was just unfulfilled and directionless. And I did have amazing friends. And I was lucky because I was working, but I was doing the same kind of work for years and years and years and not really progressing or growing. I think that's another really important thing to constantly be learning and growing as a human. And yeah, I just felt like this kind of loneliness and like there was something else for me. And I didn't know what it was at the time, but I knew I had to make a big life change to get something different. Of course, you're a model between Paris and London for those years. You jokingly talked about you weren't very good at modeling in our no, offline conversations. <laughs> but the other main job was being a TV host. Mm -hmm. You've hosted Channel 5, Vogue, and a lot of fashion TV. So what exactly does a TV host entail? Because especially on social media, we're, we're in this almost famous air quote culture mm -hmm. where with any following, with anything, you feel like you're almost famous. So I was hosting for a late night game show that was on Channel 5 and also on ITV. It's funny because I was, I was doing that way before social media blew up. So I was like actually on TV, but somehow have less followers than, <laughs> than people that weren't. But um, yeah, so I would be hosting live TV in a studio three to four nights a week. And then I would host fashion events, online shows for fashion companies, designers, shopping centers, I guess on camera <laughs> a lot. Are there any threats between hosting TV for whatever companies or interest and hosting people's experience on the podcast? They're quite different because the when I was hosting the game show, it was very much me, just me talking to camera, maybe interacting with another host. So it wasn't as personable as doing an interview on a podcast. But I guess just having that confidence to be on camera and to talk and to own the space. Yeah, there's some similarity between it. What was the like repetitive part about that job? Is it just doing the same script? Same. Is it the scripted <laughs> aspects? Yeah, it was the same thing. I mean, it was live. So there was always going to be things a little bit different, but it was pretty much like the same routine, same script, same thing happening every night. And I don't want to seem ungrateful because I was so grateful to have a TV job on a national channel for so many years. And I'm really proud of the fact that I did that for so many years, but I just wasn't progressing with it. And I wasn't really getting seen for anything else because I'd kind of become the girl that does that late night game show. So it sounds like your four sleep gets stuck and put into this box mm -hmm. and you, you didn't really have any options to leave that box. I think I probably did. I just didn't know what to do about it or how to make a change. And so my life was just doing that show and partying. <laughs> <laughs> and it kind of got to the point where it was just breaking point. I was like, I do not want to do either of these things anymore. So that's a natural segue into your dramatic change of lifestyle, yeah. dropping this 10 plus years of legacy in London, coming to this dream crushing city of LA. <laughs> And just, yeah, what happened that made you wanted to reinvent yourself on a, such a dramatic level? I think I'd known for a while that I wanted to do something different. And I went to Burning Man, which was a crazy experience, one of the best experiences of my life. And while I was there, I just thought, I know I need to make a change. And following Burning Man, I came to stay in L.A. for a couple of weeks. And I just decided I'm going to come to L.A. I'm just going to do it. Didn't really know how. <laughs> and I'd actually met someone at Burning Man who had a production company and had said he could maybe help me out finding work and so on. And also to get a visa, an O-1 visa to come to the U.S. is, it's pretty hard. You need to get a sponsor and you need to have all these deal memos in place and stuff. And I just decided I'm going to move to L.A. So I'm going to put all my energy into focusing, doing that. And I flew back out to L.A. for meetings. I signed with a really huge manager here, which is a whole nother story that we can get into in a bit. And then I managed to get my visa and I did all of that. Now, with the whole quitting drinking and partying thing, I didn't do that right away because I, I truly believe that wherever you go, you take your problems with you, right? You don't just move to a new city and you're like, hey, I'm sober now. <laughs> so I really... Once I moved here, there were a lot of events that occurred, including the pandemic, that again caused me to take stock of my life and what I wanted. And I realized, again, if you want a different outcome, you have to do something different. The thing that just always stuck out was 
what, I have to quit drinking. I think I'd known for a long time. (laughs) You probably know and understand this. You get to the point where you're just like, I can't do this anymore. I'm ruining my life, my relationships. I'm tired. I feel awful. I don't want to be hungover anymore. So, yeah. Yeah, I've had public drunkness, Mm -hmm. disorderly conduct. It was not until five, six years later, because of my romantic relationship with my fiance now, I was forced to make a change. At that moment in time, if I didn't quit drinking, I was going to lose my soon-to-be wife. But that reminds me of a quote, is insanity is defined by doing the same things over and over again, expecting a different Mm -hmm. outcome. Yeah, it's very true. Yeah, I was kind of the same. You know, I did crazy things when I was drunk. I feel so grateful that there were angels looking over me that not worse stuff happened to me. But, you know, I couldn't get on a flight one time because I was too drunk and like just. But the thing is that I found about living in London is everyone's doing it and everyone's behaving in that way. I'm sure there's some exceptions to the rule. But even when these things were happening to me and I was humiliating myself No one ever said to me, girl, I think you need to like maybe rein in the drinking because it's just the culture there. People go out and get blind drunk every weekend. Coming to LA and being surrounded by people that didn't do that (laughs) was, you know, really inspiring for me. You know, what's crazy is I've been sober from alcohol for about three years. I partake in other substances. Life's a balance. But The moment I quit drinking, I realized I have to like explain to people why I don't drink. Mm -hmm. Because people will ask you, you don't drink? Not even a drink? What about two drinks? What about moderation? But if you tell them you don't smoke cigarettes or weed or other substances, great for you. Amazing. But alcohol is a poison. Like the research is robust, right? It's It's literally a poison. And just a quick add note is when you consume alcohol, it permeates through entire internal organs, the same mechanism the way water does. Just think about that. Your alcohol, which is literally a diluted poison, right, from distilled process, is penetrating the entirety of your organs the way same way water does. And it's scary that I was consuming that (laughs) most days for many, many years. People say to you, oh, go on, just have one, just have one. And... Yeah, people back home when I tell them that I haven't I haven't had a single drink in six months and last year I probably had about five drinks the entire year. People are just like, oh, but you'll drink again. On your birthday, you'll have a drink though. What about if you want some champagne on your birthday? Or, and I'm just like, no, I don't want to drink. And also the people that don't understand the addiction <laughs> that we had to it. I can't just have one drink. It's not like a one drink situation for me. <laughs> So I didn't expect us to go down this quitting oh. <laughs> party, but I do think it's really important because from the outside, you are on TV mm-hmm. for 12 years on a pretty big national TV in London and all these things. And you're partying Friday to Monday and people are like, oh, that's the snapshot of a dream I want to live. But the reality is very different. Yeah. That's why I'm going down this, this yeah. train. I'd been doing that job for so long. And I was very good at it. So I could do it hungover and not feeling great, which I mean, now that I don't drink, oh my gosh, it's so nice to never have to work with a hangover. It feels so good. But yeah, I could do that job with my eyes closed. So it was like pretty easy for me to be hungover or tired and still, still do it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a bad life. I'm not ungrateful for anything that happened. And and I believe everything is a lesson. But yeah, I guess from the outside, people probably did think that it kind of looked like I had it all or, you know, was having a great time. But the reality was very different. There are a lot of people that are functioning alcoholics in this world. (laughs) And I I know a lot of them. And um, that's basically what I was doing for so many years. Right. And even in the U.S., I might be wrong, but I I know that London does also have a binge drinking culture, Mm -hmm. but especially in the United States, because you can't legally drink till 21. And a lot of us or Americans will drink a lot and there's no food. I'm Korean American. In Korean culture, you drink with food. Yeah. And drink is an avenue for the container of socialization. But in America, socialization is the avenue for drinking. Yes. And of course, you know, health aside, but... Uh, That's why I wanted to just go down this train a little bit more because I'm not against drinking. I have nothing against people that drink. I drank a lot. But I think it's about does what you're doing at this moment, is it serving you or is it not serving you? 
Because if it's not serving you, it might be worth you to take a pause and review the archive of your behaviors, the patterns, the way you're showing up at work. Mm -hmm. Even if you're good at it as a functional alcoholic, there are some invisible consequences. Yeah, I agree. And I think I also have nothing against alcohol and I have friends that can enjoy it responsibly. I think you have to look at why you're having a drink like why are you turning to alcohol and if you just do it occasionally because it's fun great but if it is the only way that you can switch off and relax and you're trying to escape something else then maybe then you need to look at why you're drinking we're on the same frequency because i have a question about that because you, you said it right like addictions doesn't matter what avenue of addictions substances or alcohol or even food because food is also addiction it's always a symptom there's always something deeper. On that train, I want to ask you about comedy stuff. Mm -hmm. So I interviewed Leah Lamar, a pretty big celebrity comedy in LA. And not just her, but many of them talk about a lot of comedians first enter comedy as a form of therapy, right? So, and usually the funniest comedians have some notorious and crazy and often traumatic upbringings or stories. That's what that fuels them. I'm not saying that's your case, but did you find comedy or do you feel like the comedy found you with this container that we've been talking about? Yeah, comedy was always on my radar because I loved it. I never thought that I could do it. In London, it's very much stay in your lane. If you tell people you want to try something different, they're like, oh, really? Should you do that? I just didn't believe that I could do comedy when I was living there. And then coming to LA and seeing how everyone here is just doing whatever the hell they like, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to try comedy. And it was so healing for me because it just gave me the opportunity to write about all the really shitty things that have happened to me in my life and laugh at them and use them as lessons and use them to entertain other people. And I found that to be a really beautiful thing. I also was very lucky. Like I said, I met some, some great friends through doing comedy and that created a community around me. And I know for some people say comedy is very, a very lonely existence, but I actually found it to be a very supportive, inclusive place. And yeah, it's definitely been a form of therapy for me. Were there any transferable skills from what you did previously into comedy? Because I do know that a lot of stand-up comedy, and of course there are different slices of comedy, but a lot of stand-up comedy is delivering punchlines, the timing, and but it's a lot of writing. Having been on camera and on stage before gave me a level of confidence that perhaps people starting out in comedy didn't have. But it also was kind of a hindrance to me because I was so used to being this polished TV host. Mm. And so actually when you're doing comedy, being super polished and perfect is, is not the vibe. So I had to unlearn a whole lot of things. And yeah, I think just having to stand on a stage and tell your jokes to a room full of people just makes you really, really present. You can't be anywhere else. You can't be thinking about anything else while you're doing that. And I think the best comedians are those ones that are really present, really there with the audience, interacting with the audience, which was also a new skill for me to learn as well, having to riff with the audience. And that's really scary. Right, like crowd work and things like <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, crowd work. Very scary. <laughs> Why did you say that being polished stand-up comedian doesn't really resonate with the audiences? You've got your your timing down to a fine art. It just seems rehearsed. And the art of stand-up comedy is to make it seem like you are telling that story for the very first time to those people and to make them feel special hearing it. Um, and, and that's a skill in itself that the, the greatest comedians have because they've told those jokes thousands of times, but they make it seem like they're telling it for the first time when mm. you hear them. Do you go through your friends and families first when you're testing out material or what does your creative process look like in terms of writing great jokes? Because as you said, you don't want to tell that joke for the first time in a room of strangers. And I'm sure there are creative processes and iterations involved. I'm lucky because I have this community of mainly women that I met through Pretty Funny Women. And we have a monthly punch up brunch where we take our material and we we share our new material with each other. And then what we'll do is we'll go to an open mic and try it out just in front of other comedians, which is great, but also really bad because the other comedians aren't really listening to what you're saying because they're only thinking about what they're going to say mm. when they go up. So you don't really get a genuine reaction like you would if you were telling it to a crowd. So really you do have to try your material out 
for the first time. I mean, you can refine it a little bit through working with friends and so on, but the best way to test it is with a live audience. Mm. And as for sharing jokes with family and friends before, I mean, that is just a disaster for me. (laughs) I will tell my husband a new joke premise and he'll just look at me blankly and then that will just turn into an argument. (laughs) So yeah, one of the first things um, that Lisa Sunset, who runs Pretty Funny Women, told us was, do not run your jokes with your partner. <laughs> it just never works out. So yeah, my advice to anyone that wants to practice comedy is to go to an open mic or find a group of fellow comedians to practice with. Mm. It's too much pressure on family and friends as well, you know. Yeah. They're going to want to laugh at it, but if they don't find it funny, it's really awkward and yeah. Yeah, you feel hurt. Mm-hmm. I have a question and let me contextualize why I want to ask this question. I do want to ask you about maybe for you to share the times where you flopped and you bombed on stage. And I want to focus on the uncertainty and that risky feeling. And I want to tie that into when you decided to this very audacious move to drop everything in London and come to LA. And sure, the gods graced you with Burning Man and the connections, and now it's been working fine. But that's not the story for everyone. And I'm sure there is a heightened level of that anxiety and fear because of the unknown. Mm -hmm. And I sort of see some connections between that fear and insecurity and what experience that you have internally when you do bomb on the stage. But anything for you comes up there. Yeah. um, In terms of bombing, I am vegan and very much into a healthy lifestyle now. And I have jokes about that. And those only work with very certain LA crowds that get that. I have Uh. told my vegan jokes before. And people have literally booed when I've said I'm a vegan. (laughs) It's like, oh, I've already started now. I'm going to just have to keep going. And I kind of commit to it and then make a joke about the fact that nobody laughed and move on. (laughs) Yeah, it's horrible when nobody laughs at your joke. And it feels like it's eternity that you're standing on the stage and no one's laughing. But it's probably a couple of seconds, you know, and then you just move on and you do something else. And it is scary. Every time I get on the stage, I feel scared. And moving to LA was also very, very scary. But I was lucky. I actually, I'd found a place to live through some friends, through the whole Burning Man community. So I had a place to land with roommates and I'd signed with this manager. So I felt pretty supported. And then I was here for hmm, maybe a couple of months and my manager suddenly passed away. Wow. Yeah. And that was really scary for me because I kind of looked to him as like this father figure and this, he was very well known in the industry, John Farriter, God rest his soul. And um, yeah, to suddenly lose him. And then a couple of months later, it was a pandemic. I had no work, no manager. I was like, should I move back to London? Like, what should I do? What am I going to, how am I going to survive basically? But I'd made this commitment to myself that I was going to see this through. So, so I stayed and it wasn't the easiest thing, (laughs) but I'm still here. I was going to share my favorite vegan joke, but then I do want (laughs) to talk about John very briefly. I'm not really in the entertainment industry. I just happen to have a podcast, but Would you be open to share some of the internal landscape and your internal reality? Because as you said, when you're feeling scared and when you didn't really see anything on the horizon, John appeared in your life. And I'm sure that was a very serendipitous and amazing moment, Mm -hmm. like gracious moment. Yeah. And I'm very big on meaning making because I think all of us are meaning making people Mm -hmm. and we choose to make meetings out of certain events or situations. A, did you make any meetings, like good or bad omen from this great mentor, this safe haven for you that passed away or anything that came up for you during that time? Yeah, well, firstly, I signed with him because I messaged him on Facebook and he replied to my Facebook. And I just think that is an amazing story for anybody that's seeking representation. Just reach out to people by whatever means. He didn't reply to my email. So I was like, I'm going to message him on Facebook. And that's how I got a meeting, flew out to meet him before I moved here, signed with him. And then when I was here and he passed away that was like so shocking I was I'd only been here for a few months now looking back I realized that if I had not signed with him I wouldn't have had the confidence to move to LA so he was a catalyst for me moving here to change my life and actually around the time that he passed I had started dating 
this guy who's now my husband. <laughs> um, so it was kind of strange in a way that this important male figure in my life had passed. And then I, I met the guy that is now my husband. So that was just kind of a, a strange thing, I guess. I just found it interesting that I still had this like person to here to support me. And yeah, I do really believe that John was a part of my life to bring me to LA and to start on this path. And the funny thing is now I was signed with him to be a TV host and I still love hosting. I really, really do. But I really am focusing on acting right now. So actually he probably wouldn't have been the right manager for me mm. right now. But he was an amazing person and helped, helped me on my journey to get here. I know we've been talking about similarities or differences between like the British and mm -hmm. American culture, but in terms of TV hosting, since you brought it up, are there any nuances or differences the way American does their TV hosting and maybe British do their TV hosting or is it the same skeleton, the same structure? I don't really know. I feel like people have very different styles. I just think American TV hosts are way more polished than oh. British hosts. <laughs> they have perfect hair and perfect smiles. And I guess there's so much, so many different shows. It varies. But yeah, I think overall Americans are just more shiny and perfect. <laughs> mm, interesting. So speaking of Americans are more polished, let's talk about your podcast. What have you learned about like the grittiness of LA and really the difficulty that most people just don't understand to make it in either Hollywood or entertainment industry? Because when you ask a 12 year old now, what do you want to do? I want to become an influencer. <laughs> 10 years ago, it was to become an astronaut or the president. Right? Yeah. So like I said, this almost famous culture is almost ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. So we'd love for you to share some of the behind the scenes that you've seen by unveiling the curtain, by actually talking to famed guests or talents who are well known in the Hollywood and for them to share their juicy details and stories on your podcast. Yeah. So I started my podcast because I am so fascinated by Hollywood and all the people here. And I, I just love the creative diversity and so much creativity around. But every single one of my guests works really, really hard and has done for years. There's no quick fix. I think you see people get this like overnight success. But even people that are very successful influencers, there are some people that did really well because they were early. They joined TikTok when it, you know, first started or they've been doing YouTube for I don't even know, like 20 years or however long it is. But every single person that I have encountered that is pursuing their dream here works really hard. They are taking classes. They are creating content. You know, it's like every day doing mindset work to stay positive, to keep pursuing their dream. So I do think there is this kind of unrealistic goal that you'll just post a few Instagram posts and become a famous influencer. But I think, I mean, I know you've had influencers and people with huge social media followings on the podcast. Those people work really hard or they had qualifications before they started doing it. They have something else that they're bringing to being an influencer. And I think you have to really be so passionate about what you're doing to be able to have that staying power to want to wake up every day and do it because it's really hard. <laughs> Yeah. And a lot of the people I interact with from the entertainment industry, that's why I said it's a lonely path mm. because, oh, just be consistent. Just think positive, be optimistic. When you have two or three rejections, sure. But when you have rejections every single day for months and years, how do you stay positive? How do you look for the good sides when all you see left and right is rejections from so many things? And when you get rejected, it's not just a rejection you feel devalued. You feel like your worth has been denied. And there's, there's so much there to rejection yeah. psychologically. I do so many auditions that I don't get the job <laughs> for. So I'm used to doing, and I've been doing this my, my whole career. So I'm kind of used to it. And you do become a little bit immune to it. And it is really annoying when you audition for a job that you think you're perfect for and you really want to do and you don't get it. I really had to change my mindset. And I think you have to know that your worth is intrinsic. It's not like you are just worthy because you are a human and you're alive. It's not whether you book that part in that movie or that commercial that has nothing to do with it. And I think as you get older, you realize and having had friends that are casting directors or casting for projects, 
the best actor doesn't get the job. It's who looks right or who reminds the director of some, something that they like. Maybe the person reminds them of their girlfriend and they're like, oh, she's really great. I'm going to give her the job. Like, There's so much. It's not just being a good actor. It's not about doing the best audition. It's just so much more than that. And you're being selected by other humans that have preferences and thoughts and I don't know. You have to know that you could be the best person for that job, but you might not get it just because of whatever arbitrary reason. So it's almost like so many people have this illusion that they could control the uncontrollable process. Since as you said, it's not like academic settings where the amount of input, like studying and research, will usually correlate with level of output. Yeah. If you've done a lot of preparations, the results will speak to it on a somewhat generalized statement. But it sounds like that is not the case for auditions and actual Hollywood process whatsoever. I don't find it to be. And obviously for the big projects, they just pick someone who's famous. You know, there's a very small pool of people that are being considered for those roles. But yeah, I think, like you say, it's not something you can control. You have absolutely no control over it. You do the best audition you can do. You do your best work. And for me, I send it and forget about it. I literally forget what auditions I've already done. And I think that's one of the reasons that I wanted to do comedy and to have a podcast because those are things that I can control. I can be a performer. I can book my own shows. I can have a podcast. And I think those actually most of my guests that I interview on the podcast say the same thing. Have something in your life that you can control because you can't control this industry and booking jobs. You can control going to class every week. You can control doing a podcast, writing scripts, making a short film. So those are things that you can focus on. So finding some sort of a motive control or just agency mm -hmm. that you, your her mental health is not completely destroyed yeah. at the same time still be detached to the process by doing what you can yeah I definitely see. so let's circle back to the stories the hollywood reveal this is another vast question helen is there a specific story that was told on your podcast the hollywood reveal that really captured you for whatever reasons and that really that you either think about because i've been doing this for almost four years i've done many episodes and I can't remember all of that, but I do have a few episodes that continue to speak out. Christine, who graciously yeah. introduced you and connect us, her story of leaving circus or leaving Google to start a circus trip stands out because of just the craziness behind that. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be that crazy, but just memorable stories yeah. that stuck with you. This kind of follows on from what we were just talking about. Um, so I had a guest who's a very good friend, Joe Lame Ray. And she got a part in a big movie with Jennifer Aniston Whoa. and I've forgotten his name. It will come back to me. Adam Sandler. I can't believe I forgot his name for a moment. I love him. So she was in a movie with those two, did a bunch of auditions, callbacks, got the part. And then um, when the movie came out, all of her scenes were cut. So you could literally see her arm next to Jennifer Aniston in a few of the scenes. She was meant to be playing Jennifer Aniston's Maid of Honor or something. And they just basically edited her out of all of it. And most of my guests have a story like that. So even when you think you've booked the job, you've nailed the audition, you're on set, you're filming it, you might not even make the cut. So there's like so many levels to it. And my husband had a similar story. He um, got a part in the OA. And oh, great show yeah, on Netflix. He loved the show and then he got a part in it. And I uh, went to San Francisco to shoot for a whole day. He had a big scene interacting with the main character, completely cut. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and everyone has a story like that. And I just think that always stands out to me that Hollywood's really brutal. It's really harsh. And that's why you have to have your own projects going on. Because like I say, even when you book the big job, you know, you might not actually make it to the big screen. This show is not sponsored by Burning Man <laughs> or OA. It stands for Original Angel on Netflix, but OA is probably a category of one. Mm -hmm. That show is so unique. Yeah. Right? There's, I've never seen any other shows like that show. And I personally view, I think there's this, this thing that every creative is trying to strive for is to become a category of one. Mm -hmm. It's not just a niche. Yeah. You stand your own ground and there's no one else doing what you're doing. Yeah. And every great is a category of one, right? Bill Burr, Conan O'Brien, they are just entirely unique and no one else can do what they do. Mm -hmm. So I just want to spotlight OA because that's one of my favorite shows. on. Yeah, on the show. I feel like Succession is one of those as well. I've been hearing that a lot. 
Yeah. Have you uh, seen it? No, my uh, my friend's HBO account just uh, <laughs> my Apple TV had to update, so I lost the access. Oh, no. <laughs> so I'll text him yeah. too. But I've heard great things about it. Yeah, it's a dark comedy. It's a dark comedy. Yeah, it's absolutely amazing. I don't, it's probably just everything: the acting, the directing, the way it's shot. It's just in a league of its own. Mm, so interesting. yeah, you should watch it. Maybe uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe this is a sign yeah. <laughs> for me to rewatch OA or watch this yeah. session. So in terms of the podcast, again, one thing I realized from four years of podcasting is there are certain universal themes mm -hmm. that pop up with different sectors of experiences or guests. And it's not intentional because I don't really use leading questions, but invariably, because human experiences are universal in many ways, you see the same through lines over and over again. Are there some universal, not lessons per se, but just universal themes aside from the mindset, create something that you can control, like agency of control to prevent burnout mentally. And it's really hard work. And Hollywood is brutal, even more brutal than what people think. Aside from the things you share, yeah. any other universal things that popped up from wide ranging guests that you've had on the Hollywood Review? Um, a lot of people's advice is to really figure out who you are before you embark on. Because when I moved to LA, I, I don't feel like I had a great sense of identity. I was still a crazy party girl. But I think really knowing yourself, knowing your story, owning your truth, whatever type of artist you are or performer, I think that is really important just to really know yourself. And I think doing mindset work and working on yourself is just as important as going to acting class and singing lessons, whatever it is that you do. Right, because mindset work and I guess knowing or having a solidified sense of who you are is probably the foundations for your emotions. Mm -hmm. Because if your sense of self is solidified, when you get rejected, you don't feel like a piece of shit. Yeah. You're like, well, that sucked for two seconds, but I know who I am. Yeah. So when you don't have that operational point, I'm sure the challenges are even more yeah. And a lot more stressful. And it's like that idea of destination happiness. Like, I'll be happy when I'm on a Netflix show or I'll be happy when I book this national commercial or whatever. You're not going to get that job till you're happy in yourself. You know, you have to be happy along the journey and enjoying what you're doing and how you're creating and growing and seeing every audition as an opportunity to practice and to share your art. If you flip it so that your auditions are a chance for you to share your art with the casting director, that makes it a lot easier than this is a job interview. And if I don't get it, my worth is nothing. <laughs> I will be happy when syndrome is so real. Yeah. Right? I'll be happy when I get a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. If you're unhappy now, you won't be happy. Yeah. You're going to be more miserable. Yeah. But in terms of the sense of self. I want to ask you a question by Josh, the media person. So he wanted to know, and I think it's a great question. Hey, Josh. Hey, Josh. Is, have you ever felt that working in entertainment industry, that you had to compromise your personal or cultural values? I would say when I was working as a TV host, I... <laughs> which is kind of ironic because that was the time when I was like <laughs> drinking and partying and behaving very badly. But my, I guess my online image and my on-screen persona, I was, I, yeah, kind of the image of a good girl, preppy and smiley and happy. Yeah. So I think I did hide parts of myself. I feel like the culture that I was brought up in was very much like that as well. You know, be a good girl. I was brought up Catholic. And so it was very much have this outward persona of, yeah, being, I guess, perfect and happy and everything's great in a way. And that's what I loved about coming to L.A., feeling this freedom to do um, comedy and to just be myself and to not care. And my parents definitely <laughs> don't like some of my stand up and the content that I talk about. But you talked about like being a Catholic and raised mm -hmm. sounds like in a not conservative, but in a strict household in mm -hmm. some way. Maybe that's your household's culture or just a larger culture. This is a personal question, but I'm curious, do you see any relationship between your more party out there lifestyle versus this highly controlled environment that you grew up in? Yeah, I feel like uh, most of my friends that had quite strict or religious upbringings <laughs> ended up being the wildest ones. So I think there is a rebellion, even if it's, it's like it's subconscious. I don't think I ever thought because of my upbringing, I want to break free. I mean, my parents were pretty liberal in a way, but 
we were definitely brought up with Catholic values, some of which are great and some of which not so great. But I, I do think that, you know, partying and all of that stuff is for because there is a void and some some need that wasn't met in our childhood or in our life. And that's why we turn to drinking. So I'm sure there is a correlation there. On that same train, Helen, is there a certain belief or things you used to believe in and uphold that you no longer believe? And because you talked about the biggest reason why you came to LA to reinvent yourself is you wanted to progress yeah. and upgrade your internal mm -hmm. operating systems or your beliefs. We live in this such a polarized world because so many people have their fixed mm -hmm. and outdated internal reality map and they're navigating externally based on their outdated and fixated internally map. And that's cognitive rigidity, right? Yeah. And you have to update your beliefs. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck in the old ways. It's not their fault, but you have to upgrade that. So for you, are there any beliefs or things that you used to uphold and no longer? Yeah. Well, I think one of the biggest things that you can learn is that your beliefs maybe aren't even yours. You pick them up from somewhere. Mm. <laughs> your caregivers, your parents, most likely religion. And that your beliefs aren't true. <laughs> Just because you believe them, it doesn't make them true. And so I had to do a lot of mindset work around self-worth and actually reprogramming my brain to know that we are all worthy just because we are humans and we were born on this planet and that our worth is not determined by anything. There's no scale, like who created the scale of worth? Like that's just made up. So that was a big one, reprogramming my mind with that one and really um, questioning all my beliefs. Why do I believe things work this way? And, and looking at my life and seeing the reoccurring patterns and why these things are happening and then looking at the beliefs that cause those and then reprogramming those. And I actually listened to the episode um, with Zach. The, Zach Princess. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I love that. I loved what he was saying about how you can hypnotize yourself with your own thoughts. I mean, we are all hypnotized all the time. We're kind of, we're just believing, we're just acting on whatever our belief systems are. But the amazing thing is you can change your belief systems. And I love that. So it's a lot of work. And <laughs> there are things you can do that help, but it is possible. It's like when I used to drink, I would complain that why is my life so chaotic, right? Why did I almost get stabbed? Why did bad shit happen to me only? But the truth was hidden in plain sight. It's because I would black out all the time. Yeah. Well, obviously chaos would ensue. Mm -hmm. But that aside... I want to talk about mindset work. You mm -hmm. brought that up quite a few times yeah. so far. Like what were some of the actual processes and details involved in reprogramming your minds? Because as you said, we are the embodiment of all the conditioning and programming, societally, religion, parents, teachers. So how did you do that? And what did that mindset process look like? Because mindset process sounds cool. And a lot of people say that, but I love to hear the nitty gritty details. Yeah, so I'll just preface it with the fact that when I was quarantining, I was drinking every single day. And it got to the <laughs> point where I was like, what am I doing? Like, I feel awful. What can I do? And so the changes that I made were very slow and gradual. It's like the compound effect. I tried to drink less and then I would do yoga every day. And then I'd want to wake up and do yoga and I wouldn't want to be hung over while I was doing yoga. Mm. So then I would reduce the drinking. And so it wasn't like I didn't just do a like, I'm going to quit drinking right away thing. Because also, alcohol was so ingrained in my identity. I was like, I can't quit drinking. <laughs> Who will I be? It was scary. So I started doing yoga, meditation, just watching random things on YouTube. And then coming out of the pandemic, I actually did um, Tony Robbins UPW. Mm. Love Tony Robbins. Not That's not necessarily my that sort of state-based learning, you know, where you're like really hyped up, <laughs> you know, Tony Robbins style. <laughs> um, but I love a lot of what he teaches and what he says. And through discovering him, I found a lot of other people, including um, Dr. Joe Dispenza, mm. who was really life-changing for me. I read his book, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. I think I said that right. And there's a meditation technique that he has in that. And that really helped me create new neural pathways and quit drinking and you do this whole thing where every time you think about drinking then you suddenly change the thought and I would mm. do that meditation every day and that really helped and still am diving into whole this whole like nervous system reprogramming I mean my nervous system was fried I never learned how to to regulate my nervous system ever 
as a child, I was always told that I was hysterical. And then when I was hysterical, I'd get shouted at and smacked and sent to my bedroom. And I feel like I was just in that state for so many years. And then obviously drinking and partying and then you're hungover and my nervous system, I didn't even know it was a thing that you needed to regulate your nervous system. <laughs> so yeah, learning that was like, whoa, mind blowing. And so then just doing different types of therapies, EFT tapping and things like that, um, breath work and meditation um, and just different practices like that. And then really, once you stop drinking and you're sober and you can feel everything and then you feel everything in your body, you realize that everything's in your body. You can't intellectualize everything. You know, your feelings are kept in your body, your emotions, your intuitions in your body. As an actor, you need to be able to access your body to really feel everything that you're portraying. So um, I've gone off on a tangent here, but <laughs> yeah, those are kind of the modalities and the different things that I dove into. And then I guess it's been three years of, of doing that and different practices and Honestly, journaling, and that's something anyone can do right now. Journaling really helped me to just get really clear on what I wanted, how I was feeling. And that's something that I do every day, every morning. So so you're saying that your life didn't cease to exist after you quit partying? No, yeah. <laughs> it just got better. I feel like I have more time. I, for years, especially because I was working on a late night show, told everyone that I was a night owl and I loved being up late. And that was also because I like to do things that made me stay awake till late. Um, and now I'm like a 5.30 a.m. wake up person. I love to be up with the sun. I like to be in bed by 9.30. Same, same. <laughs> and I feel great. I feel the best I've ever felt in my life. But um, yeah, I would say my life is so much better. This show is also not sponsored by Alcoholic Anonymous yeah. or 12 Step. But I like the tangent because... A, it shows that dramatic changes are not happening in a dramatic sense. Mm -hmm. It's micro habits stacking up that creates a macro impact. Mm -hmm. And that actually reminds me of habit stacking, a concept by James Clear in mm -hmm. Atomic Habits, where you can stack different habits, create this ecosystem of habits where if you slip off in one habit, you have other habits too that you can fall upon on. But I really want to put this on a messaging board, as you said, Helen, beautifully, that A, this took three years. And B, there is hope that we can get reprogrammed and reconditioned, even with decades of partying and somewhat reckless lifestyles. Mm -hmm. And now you're able to almost rewire how you feel. And you're at a, this such a better place emotionally, mentally, physically. And I love talking about doing the work mm -hmm. because doing the work is this catch-22 phrase everyone says. But with Working on mental health, as you said, if you're not feeling too great to do yoga that day, maybe you can journal. Mm -hmm. If you're not feeling well physically, you can use psychology as an entry point. But if you're not feeling well mentally for whatever reasons, maybe someone passed away in your life, like John, or maybe you had a stressful situations, and you're like, no, today's not the day where I meditate for two hours. No problem. Go on a walk. Mm -hmm. Then you can use physic, like physical mm -hmm. stuff as an entry point. Yeah. There's so many ways to do the work. But I think it requires a first step. Yeah. And I love that. I love what you said about the the stacking. If you make things a regular practice and then, like you say, one falls off, or you're a bit tired that day and you don't wake up in time to journal, but you do something else that day. Yeah. I think that's so important. And to just have tools on hand, even if it is, I mean, it seems so basic, doesn't it? Like just going for a walk. But you forget to do that when you're in the midst of frenzy and stress and heartache or whatever it is. You don't think, oh, I'm just going to take a deep breath and go for a walk in the sunshine. And I think, yeah, sometimes we just need reminding of doing those simple things. To bring it all the way around, do you feel like, Helen, that void that you've been not running away from, that you weren't as aware of until now. How is that void feeling like these days? Well, so much better. I'm so creative now. You know, I'm in acting class. I'm always creating characters. I'm doing my podcast. I'm writing. And so I think having a goal really helps with filling whatever that void is, having something that you're working towards and having creative endeavors fills that. Um, I'm also very happily married, which is Whoa. something, thanks, <laughs> um, which is something 
that seemed like an impossibility when I was in my crazy party drinking stage. So I guess having that stable and loving relationship helps with that. I feel like there's always, as humans, there's probably always some kind of void that we're trying to fill in some way. And and I do think you can go so far down the mindset route and working with coaches and doing all of that and then trying to do that to fill the void. Mm. But I will say now, I absolutely love my own company. I'm so happy just being on my own. And that was something I couldn't do before. If I was on my own, I would have a glass of wine and be scrolling Instagram. (laughs) You know, I had to be doing something to like stimulate myself at all times. But now I can just sit and be, read. In fact, that's one of my favorite things to do. Just sit at home and read and chill out. And yeah. So I think to answer your question, I think it has changed the void, Mm. whatever the void is. (laughs) And now you you enjoy going on nature walks with your adopted dog. Yeah, I rescued a little, um, a little rescue dog who is the love of my life alongside my husband. (laughs) (laughs) In that order? (laughs) (laughs) I kind of think so in that order because Speedy, my dog needs me to survive, but my husband would be fine without me. (laughs) But yeah, I just love being in nature. That's the other beautiful thing about LA. The, the weather's not great right now, but most of the time we have good weather and palm trees and beautiful hikes. And so it's easy to go outside and appreciate nature here. And The 30% increase of living costs from the East Coast to the West Coast, I call it the sun tax. Yes. You're paying taxes for the sun. Yeah. And yeah, We it need is. our money back right now. <laughs> What's going on with this June gloom? And the last three months, it's been raining yeah. a lot. It's been a pretty interesting, but... Yeah. I ask that also in terms of the void, because it's this is not a gotcha show, right? Mm-hmm. I have my former patients and clients listen to my podcast, so I have to abide by what's authentic and what's true to me. But I think especially now where, as you talked about expediency, you want it now, mm-hmm. instant gratification is only getting worse. We have this false idea that, oh, when you enter your 30s, it's doom and gloom. Once you quit partying, the life's fun gets hijacked up from you. But I feel the best now ever Mm -hmm. than I did in my early 20s, mid 20s, and even late 20s. I feel amazing. And of course, a lot of that is with alcohol. But I just want to really put this saying that A, change is possible, as you beautifully said. And B, I think when you're about to make a big major life decisions, people get caught up in looking at what you're going to lose Mm -hmm. from that decision, the trade-off. But people don't look at what you're going to gain. Mm-hmm. Because from the outside, your life now may be considered as boring to yeah. some of your <laughs> friends back home. For sure. Right? You're not partying three nights straight, getting tables in nightclubs, interacting with whatever. And it's so much more simple. But I find beauty in simplicity and I love my life. But some people might find my life incredibly boring, but I love it. Yeah. So I just want to put that message of hope on the message. Yeah, point. definitely. I don't even post on social media as much as I used to because I just don't feel the need to. So I'm sure people think I'm living some very boring life now. But <laughs> isn't it ironic? I post less, but I'm way happier than I've than I've ever been. I'm not trying to show off about anything on social media anymore. Right. And your reels are really funny. Oh, thank you. No, like I, I like <laughs> your behind the scenes with your guests. Yeah. You try to dance with them or replicate. I, I really think they're, my favorite one was the beach one, oh. you and your husband, <laughs> where you were covered by his hair in the yeah. winds. I, yeah, because it feels very real yeah. to me. I want to make more of those. That's something that I want to focus on. Awesome. I love talking to people like you because your lifespan spans across so many different sectors and experiences. And some people may like, wait, how did that person go from that to modeling to this, TV host to this, from partying to not drinking? And humans were all the embodiments of contradictions. That's why life's in the gray, right? You can be a good mother but also be a bad employee. There's more so multidimensional. Mm-hmm. And I think you beautifully embody that we are all more than what's on the outside. And we have to do what's right for us, not for anyone's sake and not to appease anyone. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. So with everything we said, where can people check you out? Check out the juicy stories that you uphold on your podcast. Maybe see you bomb on the stage with yeah. vegan jokes. <laughs> oh, before we wrap it up, my favorite vegan joke is, how do you know when a vegan and a CrossFitter enter the bar? 
Because they'll tell you. Because they'll tell everyone about yeah. it. <laughs> That's the only vegan yeah. joke that I know. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, I was a vegan for a year. So <laughs> I definitely told everyone, I'm a vegan now. But with that being said, yeah, where can people find you? What do you have going on? So the best place to find and follow me is on Instagram. Um, that's where I'll post about my shows. And um, that's where all my reels and things will be. And I am Helen Shephard One. Shepherd. it's weird spelling. S-H-E-P-H-A-R-D. Then the number one. That's my same handle on TikTok. And then my podcast is The Hollywood Reveal, which you can find on all major podcast platforms. And that has an Instagram and a TikTok as well, if you want to find and follow there. And my website is helenshepherd.com. But honestly, I think Instagram is probably the best one. That's where, I, where I'm most active. And it is The Hollywood Reveal. Yes. And I urge people to check it out. They have some crazy stories on the <laughs> podcast, right? And yeah, I do feel like we need, we can gain a lot of life experience through exposure. You don't have to fail 40 times. See other people fail 40 times, <laughs> yeah. fail a few more times yourself, but you can learn something from yeah. that. I just want to ask you for one favor before we close out. If you enjoyed today's conversation with Helen, I ask you to share this episode with one friend, one friend only. It is free for you or priceless for me. And with that being said, I will include all of Helen's show notes in the episode descriptions. And as always, I hope you enjoy today's Discover More content. And I hope you choose Discover More and Curiosity over Fear next time. And as always, see you on the next week's train of Discover More. Thank you for listening.